everybody to pass out the lessons. So that's what they get for leaving. Uh, but anyway, um, so we're, we're thankful that, uh, that we can meet together even if they're not here. So let's look at this. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're, let's uh, stand together in uh, honor of the Word of God as we read our text. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for those who are here tonight. We thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you for their desire to hear from you and to learn more about your word. And I pray that as uh, we dig into your word tonight here in the book of Revelation, that you might give us understanding and uh, that you might speak to our hearts uh, what we, each one of us, need to hear this evening. I do pray for... My wife and Jason, as they travel, keep them safe. And uh, Lord, for James and Jared, as they travel on Thursday, I pray that you would give them safe flights uh, and a safe trip home. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, just for your presence uh, in our meeting tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> and so this, as we look at it, is... The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, most Bibles, uh, mine doesn't, but most Bibles that I've ever had, when you get to the book of Revelation, it says the revelation of St. John the Divine, you know, right, right at the beginning of the book. And no, it's not. It's not the revelation of St. John the Divine. Verse 1 says exactly what it is. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, it makes it pretty clear who it is. Now, the book of Revelation, obviously, like the rest of the New Testament, was written in Greek, but it does carry a distinct Hebrew flavor because many of the idioms are Hebrew in nature. There are about 550 references to Old Testament passages throughout the book of Revelation, and it's closely related to the book of Daniel. And the book of Revelation really is like a sequel to the book of Daniel. It, it uh, kind of carries on the same theme that uh, Daniel uh, has throughout the prophetic part of the book. <clears throat> there are not only comparisons to be made with the book of Daniel, but also with the book of Genesis. So here we are, we're beginning the very end. Genesis, as we know, is the very beginning and yet there are comparisons and contrasts between the very beginning and the very end books. In the book of Genesis, paradise is lost, whereas in the book of Revelation, paradise is regained. In Genesis, you have the Garden of Eden, while in Revelation, you have the city of God. In Genesis, you have the tree of life hidden, as we know, after the fall of Adam and Eve, God placed cherubim there at the entryway into the garden uh, to keep people from uh, getting to the tree of life whereas in the book of Revelation the tree of life is manifest it's not just manifest it's open and welcome uh, for, for any to partake in the book of Genesis the serpent appears while in the book of Revelation the serpent is doomed in the book of Genesis, it's the beginning of sin and its curse of sorrow and tears. The book of Revelation shows us the end of sin and its curse of sorrow and tears. So uh, there's, again, there's comparisons and contrasts that can be made uh, between the very beginning and the very ending of the scripture. Again, the, the theme of the book is Christ because it is the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Revelation simply means a revealing. It's a revealing of Christ. It's a revealing of what Christ is about to do. It, it's all about Him, really. It, it's, you know, people, oh, well, it's about end times. No, it's about Christ. And it's about what He's going to do 
in the end times. The end times just really are um, a, a sideline here. The main focus is Christ. It's the Lamb. It's the Word of God. It's His rule for a, a thousand years and, and, and so on. It, as you go throughout the book, you see that. So what we see is that He controls the factors of time and space, and that is laid out so clearly throughout the book of Revelation. In the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, we read, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. In other words, by Him all things are held together. He's, he's doing things, He's allowing things to continue on as they are by His own pleasure and by His own power. And so He controls the factors of time and of space, and he precipitates and determines the events of the last days. You say, well, how do we know that? Because the book of Revelation exists. Because he already tells us this is what it's going to be like in the last days. And so he not only controls time and space now, but he's in control of the last days. Look, we are not in days out of God's control. Now, everybody is acting like that, Act like God, God died of Rona somewhere. I'm, I'm not kidding. And I think that's a disgrace for God's people to run around like scared little kids acting as if God died when God still lives. And he reigns and he's in control. We need to trust him because he's in control. Look, he wrote the end of the book and we're not there yet if we can't trust him now what are we going to do when the end of the book comes around now we, we, we'll, we'll talk about some of that here in a minute because uh, I don't, I don't want to leave a misconception you know that believers are going through the tribulation because the scripture is clear about that believers are not going through the tribulation but again I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's look at the structure of the book of Revelation. And it is unusual. It is chronological in nature. Uh, but it takes a break from the chronology to fill in the gaps with greater information. And we'll see that when, when we get to those particular chapters. And uh, I had one, one gentleman <clears throat> somewhere along the line. And I don't even remember who or where. I just, I just remember hearing one gentleman say, well, the book of Revelation really tells the same story three times. And I've read through the book of Revelation, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, dozens of times over the years I've read through the book of Revelation. And, and every time I read through the book of Revelation, that, I, I'm reminded of, of whoever it is that said that. And then as, as I read it, I think, no, no, it's not. It's not telling the same story three times. It's chronological. It's in order with, again, those gaps to fill in, fill in some other information uh, that uh, the Lord wants us to know about. Symbolism. There is all sorts of symbolism in the book of Revelation, but there are other things that people take to be symbolic that is not, that should be taken literally. Does that sound confusing? It can be for, especially for somebody who's lost. Because here's what, what happens. Somebody who's lost, they don't give a rip about God. They don't care about the Bible, but they're scared to death about the future. They'll read the book of Revelation. And they can't, they don't get it. You know why they don't get it? because they're lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 tells us that the things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned and the natural man cannot, can't receive them, can't understand them, can't grasp it because they're carnal, they're lost. There's no, the Spirit of God uh, is not in, in dwelling their hearts and so they read it and all this symbolism, well, uh, so it talks about this and that must mean this and it talks about that and that must mean this and, and they come up with a, a freak show out of the book of Revelation we have to be really careful not to do that 
The thing is, symbolism is not an unusual trait in the scripture. What do you have in, in the parables? The kingdom of God is like unto a mustard seed. Well, what is that? That's symbolism. Except that he explains what the symbol is, right? Grain of mustard seed, that's like the kingdom of God. I mean, it's very obvious. And he explains that, which I'm going to talk about. But especially relating to... Um, to prophecy, you find symbolism. Uh, we were reading Sunday, uh, in the message Sunday, one of the scripture that we read was out of the book of Amos, where God says to Amos, what do you see? And Amos says, I see a basket of summer fruit. And then God goes on to explain, I'm not going to keep passing by the nation of Israel, but I am going to bring judgment. That's, that basket of summer fruit is symbolic of it's it's time for the fruit to be harvested it is you know uh what, what we would say it's time for the chickens to come home to roost you know and again that symbolic speech is what we're doing so it, it's not unusual to run across symbolism and we have to as i mentioned uh be very careful to properly interpret these symbols Otherwise, we're going to end up in left field. And here's an example in our notes. Uh, one author, and actually it's more than one, I can remember as a little boy, uh, I, I was at the Christian bookstore and they had these comics because back in the day they used to have Christian comics. And, uh, and I remember reading one and it was more or less about the book of Revelation. And it went right along here. So this author stated that the creatures described in, in Revelation chapter 9 are nothing more than helicopters. And that's what this comic book said. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. So I went and looked at it, and I thought, I, I don't get it. I don't see it there. Um, anyway, but that's contrary to the context of the chapter. The, the author really is allowing himself to take a flight of fancy in his interpretation of symbolism. And that's what happens so many times with the book of Revelation. People, they have no grounds, they have no basis, but they say, well, this is this, and this is this, and this is this, and so all of that means this. Which when you look at those things, it's like, where do you get that this is this and this is this? Where, where is that? It's from their own mind. But they will argue and fuss and fight and beat you over the head and call you anything but a believer if you disagree with them. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about some, some things I heard just recently about some things in Revelation and uh, somebody wanted to tell me what certain things were and it's like, but the Bible really, I mean, I, I've heard that before, but the Bible doesn't really say that. I mean, we, we can sort of say, well, I can see where you would think that, but it doesn't really come out and say. So where, where the Bible doesn't really come out and say, we can come across and say, well, I believe that it means this, or I, I feel like that's what it's talking about. But to tell somebody else that they're wrong, eh, we can't really do that. We have to be careful about that. Here's the primary rule for handling symbolism, and it's a simple rule, and that is let God be his own interpreter. Now, we've talked before about this. The best Bible dictionary to define di Bible terms is the Bible. The best way to find, you know, the best commentary that you can pick up anywhere for the Bible is the Bible. Because otherwise, it's just man's ideas about what God said instead of what God said about what God said. You see what I'm saying? Because a, a commentary is secondhand. Whereas when you let the scripture comment on other scripture, that's firsthand. That's the Lord explaining what he's saying and what he's meaning. Uh, in other portions of scripture and when it comes to symbolism it's the same thing let God interpret it and if God doesn't well let's 
go on here. So the Holy Spirit is going to interpret symbolism within the context, which he does, and we'll, we'll look at some examples of that here in a minute, within the book, and we'll see some examples of that, and sometimes elsewhere in Scripture. So we have to, we have to study, don't we? But we can be sure when there is no interpretation given, there is no symbolism intended. That in, in Revelation chapter 9, where that author and that comic book that I read uh, all those years ago, when they, when they swore to me that it was a helicopter, God never said that. God never said, well, it really doesn't mean that. It's really something else, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. When God doesn't give us the interpretation that it, it's supposed to mean something other than what it is, then we need to take it literally. So, and, and, I'm, um, and I'll, I'll say something about that. So let's, let's look at some of these examples. We see the symbolism here in chapter one of the stars and the candlestick or candlesticks. Uh, look in verse 12. It says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Over in verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So there's seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. Hmm, wonder what that might mean. I don't know. Until you keep on reading. But when you keep on reading, God interprets it for us in verse number 20. So he doesn't let us go very far down the road, does he? He puts it right there in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Symbolism explained. Now we don't have to sit around and, you know, just, uh, just uh, you know, get around the table and start, you know, throwing out ideas. Well, I think the stars are this and I think the candlesticks are that. We don't have to do that. God tells us. And so now we know. Now, let me, let me tell you something uh, b before we go on to the next thing. I haven't even mentioned this, but as you well know, in our 2.30 service on Sunday, we're going through the seven churches in Asia in chapters 2 and 3. And uh, we have talked about, uh, we're, we're in the uh, third church, fourth church now, uh, the church of Thyatira. So we're a little over halfway through. Those were literal churches. Do you know how we know that? Because that's what he says. He says seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. But do you know what people do with these seven churches? They make them symbolic. They say each church represents a different time period in church history. And we are in the seventh church age. We're in the Laodicean church age where everything's bad and, and so on and so forth, which when we get to it, yes, everything's bad. Absolutely. But you know what God said? God defined what it was. He said those were seven churches, seven literal assemblies in seven literal cities. This is not time periods he's talking about. And so, again, I know a lot of people who believe, well, you know, there's all these church ages and, and they'll even say this. Well, yes, it's seven literal churches, but... But God doesn't leave any room for the but. He doesn't leave any room for the church age theory. He does not. And so that is, as we used to say, that's made up out of whole cloth. You know what that means? It means it's not true. They just made it up on their own. Because God doesn't give that interpretation. They're building that symbolism in where God doesn't put it. And that's what I'm saying. We have to be careful about that. If God doesn't put the symbolism in. We shouldn't stand there and try and beat it in there. 
you know, it's, it's like a little kid trying to take a square block and pound it through a round hole. And we know it doesn't work. And you try and tell them that, and so they'll try even harder. You know, it's just how, how little ones are a lot of times. So we need to be, uh, as, as I tell my boys, smarter than what we're working with. So instead of the Bible, we need to see literalism everywhere we look in the Bible, unless God tells us differently, which is what we're talking about here. Look over in chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, this is one uh, of the parenthetical chapters where God goes back and he fills in some information and he talks about the great whore in chapter 1, or I'm sorry, verse 1 of Revelation 17. He says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So fine. Who's the great whore? You know, who is she? As if she were an individual, right? And we could, we could, you know, we could sit around and we could, you know, throw things out there. Well, I think the great whore is this, and I think the great whore is that. But God tells us, in verse number 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now what city might that be remembering when this was written? Because we're not asking today. Because some people might say, well, New York City, because that's where, you know, UN headquarters are. And so that's, that's no, no, no. We have to consider it in context. What city was it that was ruling over the kings of the earth at the time? Well, it's Rome. I mean, we, we know that. The Roman Empire. So the great whore is what? Rome. And there's you know more details that gives us in there, uh, but we'll not look at that. Again, in verse 1, it talks about um, uh, there in the end, the angel says, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Well, what does that mean? Because, you know, the city of Rome's not like Atlantis. It's not just out there floating in the ocean somewhere or underwater or whatever the case might be. So what does that mean uh, uh, that sits on many waters? And again, we could come up with all sorts of ideas because, you know, we're smart. And we, we can imagine things, but that's all it would be. It would be our imagination, that's what I'm saying, unless we t take the time to see what God says. Look in verse number 15 here, Revelation 17, 15, he explains, and he says unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So God explains it. Excuse me, in uh, verse 3, here in chapter 17, we see the, the final example we're going to look at about symbolism, the seven-headed beast. Revelation 17, verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit unto, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So it had seven heads. Well, what, is, what does that mean? And now you get into, you know, almost sounds like mythology when, when we get to this point, except that God explains exactly what he means in verse number nine. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. All that does is help, helps us identify what city it is they're talking about. Because how many, how many mountains or how many hills is the city of Rome built on? I mean, everybody knows that. So all he's doing is using the symbolism to identify who he's talking about so that we're not sitting there thinking, hmm, well, I, you know, I wonder if he's talking about Ottawa. Because <laughs> you know, there are some hills in, in Ottawa around the city. And, um, you know, could, could it be? No, of course not. No, it, it's, it's very clear because God explains what he means. 
And so that, that's what we need to do with symbolism. Look for God to interpret it. And if there's no interpretation, then we have to take it literally. So let me, uh, let me, let me throw another symbol out there or what many people claim to be a symbol, and that would be hell. Many people look at hell. Well, the Bible talks about hell. Well, that's just talking about the place of the dead. That's all it is. It's, it's just, it, you know, and, and the hell's all in your mind. And uh, people say all sorts of things. And you know what? God never said that. Everything that God had to say about hell, if you, if you take the time to read it, he tells us to take it literally. Where the fire's not quenched, that doesn't sound symbolic to me. And there's smoke, uh, the smoke of their t uh, torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Revelation 14, 11. That doesn't sound like symbolism. That sounds like God wants us to take it literally. And that's because he does want us to take it literally. And that's why the lost need to run to Christ and run to the cross because that's their only hope of avoiding the just torment of hell. It's not symbolism because God doesn't interpret it to be symbolism. So that's how, that's how we know. Anyway, let's, let's go on. And uh, back here in chapter 1, we'll look at uh, the introduction. And we're not going to get too far here, I don't think. But uh, you say, well, there's not many notes here. And you, you don't have my page. So, um, Again, we read verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. In, in, things which must shortly come to pass. Look at the end of verse 3. It says, for the time is at hand. The introduction tells us the things that we're about to read are not for eons and eons and millennia. Now, it has been 2,000 years since Christ uh, ascended back to heaven. And so it's been a lot of years since the book of Revelation was written. But you know what? <clears throat> if it was close then, it's so much closer now. And we have to remember that. So as he inter in introduces this, he says, these are things that are not for way on down the road. And, and sometimes that's what we're guilty of. We, we say, well, I, I'm not going to read the book of Revelation. That's for, that's for later. That's for another time. No, it's around the corner. And so we do need to take the time. <clears throat> you can contrast this with the book of Daniel. In the end of the book of Daniel, God says to him, seal up the book because these prophecies are not for a long time to come. But when it gets to John, he says, it's going to shortly come to pass. What am I saying? I'm saying all the things that we read here are just around the corner. And we, we, need, to, we need to be aware of it so that we as God's people can warn others because if they don't know the Lord they're going to experience these things firsthand and that's that's a terrible thing now in verses 4 through 20 we see visions of God first of all in verses 4 through 6 you see the position of God the Son in verse 4 he's the eternal Son of God it says uh, John to the seven churches which are in Asia grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So he's the eternal son of God. In verse 5, he's the preeminent prince, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. In verse 6, he is presented as the kingmaker uh, where it says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that's the position of God the Son. 
that is an exalted position. That is the position that the Lord Jesus Christ ought to have. One of preeminence, in other words, one where he's in first place. He ought to have that position in your heart and mine every day. Not just, you know, when we're reading the Bible, but every day. So let, let's go on. We see the purpose of God the Son in verses 7 and 8. Verse 7 tells us that his purpose is that he's coming. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. He's coming. But verse 8, there he's, he, he shows his purpose as simply being, that he is the I am. How does he start? Verse 8, I am. But not only that, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Oh, he, he's not shying away from the fact that he's God in the flesh, is he? As many people say, oh, Jesus, he's, he's a God, he's an example, he's a teacher, and all the different things they say, but they sure don't want to admit that he's God. Mm. Right here, Jesus says, no, I am. I am. And, uh, and not only that, he ends up with, I am the Almighty. So that's uh, the purpose of the Son of God. You see the providence of God the Son in verses 9 through 11. Uh, in, in, let me see, in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. There we see the providence of the Son of God because who would have thought John's in, in exile, as we know. We, we talked about that in our introduction to uh, the seven churches in Asia. But he's in exile there on the Isle of Patmos. Who would have thought that God would have chosen him to write anything? Much less write it, but also send it. How's he supposed to do that? He's in exile. You know what that means? That means that your problems... Don't keep God from having plans for you. Oh, but it's hard. You think it wasn't hard for John being in exile, an old man, and he didn't even have social insurance to count on. Canada Post wasn't there at the corner for him to post this over to the seven churches. He had to figure that out. And I'm sure the Lord directed him how to do it and, and so on. But, but that's not my point. My point is the fact that his circumstances were difficult didn't mean that God had no expectations of him. God wasn't done with him. And we, we've said that before. God is not done with us until he calls us home. Until he takes us home, he has something for us to do. Uh, my grandmother, as you know, just celebrated her 100th birthday. Uh, she was uh, on the front page of the city newspaper. I know nobody saw it because nobody reads the newspaper these days, but those who went online, they, they saw her picture. I, I, somebody sent me the link and I got to read it. <clears throat> and one thing she said, it's been 20 two years since my granddad passed away and uh, and she still misses him after all this time. They were married 53 years so you can imagine that was a long time to be together and it's a long time to be apart afterward. And uh, she, you know, she talks about missing him and, and over the years she's, uh, you know, said things like, boy, you know, if the Lord takes me home, I'm ready to go because uh, I, I want to be with my granddad and wants to be with the Lord and so on. But one thing she said, and, and I couldn't believe they printed it in that article. She said, when the Lord left me here, and I can't do much but pray, my 
why God left Some me here. Here she is, 100 years old. She can't get out and walk a long way. She has a hard time getting out, walking from her bedroom to the kitchen, you know, and, and she has to sit down and she's short of breath. And, and uh, you know, time has taken its toll on her body. But the Lord's left her here for a reason. She can't hardly see. She can't hardly hear. But she can still pray. And I guarantee you, I, every once in a while, I, I get an email from my grandmother. And she doesn't say a whole lot. <clears throat> but she says, I love you and I want you to know I'm praying for you. And I believe that. And I appreciate that. And I need it. And, and I'm so thankful that even though it's hard for her physically, God left her here for a reason, for a purpose. And, uh, and the same is true with all of us. These are not the easiest times in the world in which we live. You know, sometimes it feels like you take a step forward and you get batted in the head and you know, it, it's not the, you know, one step forward and two steps back. It's the one step forward, you get batted in the head and knocked a mile back. And then you start over again uh, with that process. You know, that's, that's sort of how it feels right now uh, with everything that, that we try to do. But you know what? Uh, the Lord is still in charge. And even though things may be difficult, it, it, you know, God didn't tell us. God didn't give us a new revelation and say, look, you know, Coronavirus has made things hard. You don't have to serve God now. You, you can take a break from serving God. You, you don't have to be faithful to God now because, you know, everybody understands. No. Now, more than ever, God has a plan for us. We're here where things are, you know, thankfully not as hard as other places. But they're still not as easy as they were a year ago. And God has us here. And God left us here for his purpose. And so we need to have open hearts and open minds to be ready to partake of that purpose that God has for us because he's not limited by difficult circumstances. Let's go on. We see the person of the Son of God in verses 12 through 16. And uh, in, in uh, verses 12 through 15, we see he's the same but different. Don't you love it when people say things like that? Oh, that is exactly like it, but it's not anything the same. And you think, what are you talking about? But that's kind of what John says here. Verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Well, he should know what the Son of Man looked like because he walked with him for three and a half years. But then he goes on, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. The last time that uh, you think about it, last time that John saw Jesus would have been at the ascension. Did he look like this? Nope. He didn't look like that. And you go on, verse 14, his head, uh, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Is that what he looked like when he ascended back to heaven? Nope. It's not. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. You, you, you realize what he's saying. And, and then verse 16, you get to this. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Here, he's harking back. Now, I mean, he, he's being honest. He, he's not embellishing what, what he's saying. wouldn't be the word of God if he did that. But it, it's, I, I'm, I'm sure it was a reminder to John of another time where he turned and saw the Lord. Anybody have any idea? The transfiguration where the, the, the Lord's clothing sh uh, was shining and, and, and his uh, face and so on. And, and so that's, that's what you're seeing here. It's, it's like that. In, in other words, what he's saying is, it's like I remember, but 
better, glorified. And so that's, that's the person of the Son of God. Then you see the power of the Son of God in verses 17 through 20. And uh, in verse 17, there's the power of fearlessness. And it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, God hath not given us the power of fear, or the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's not given us the spirit of fear. There are things that happen in our lives that in the moment we think, oh, oh my. And fear wants to crop up. But we have to remember that God hasn't given us that spirit. But think, how many times did Jesus say to the disciples, fear not? Fear not. Even when he rose from the dead, you remember he came in, there they were in the upper room, <clears throat> he came in and they thought they saw a ghost. And he said, fear not. And so here he is saying the same thing. That's the power of the Son of God. It is the power of fearlessness. How is it that people over the years have laid down their very lives for the Lord Jesus Christ? How could, how could they possibly do that and not do it like screaming, blubbering idiots? How are they able to do that serenely, as it were? It's because of the power of fearlessness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, you see the power of deathlessness in verse 8. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And I tell you, if, if we ever figure out that the Lord has conquered death, well, that's going to take away a whole lot of our fear. Now, I've said this before. And I'll probably say it again a whole bunch of times, but I'm not afraid of coronavirus. I'm not. You know why? And there's a whole lot of reasons why. I'm going to give you a scriptural reason why. Because death is no big deal to the Christian. It's not the end. And the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. If I die with the coronavirus, God's in control. God didn't mess up. Oh, hmm. I wasn't going to do that, but coronavirus slipped in there. God's not caught off guard. God's in control. And if we figure that out, we don't have to be afraid. Because with him is the power of deathlessness. I was dead. I, I tell you, every time I read that, it gets me excited. I was dead, but not anymore. I love that. Because it's true. And if it's true for him, he's the firstborn of the resurrection. That means he's the very first one to be raised from the dead, to die no more. And guess what? I'm part of that group that's going to be with him to die no more. Then there's also, in verse 20, the power of knowledge where he says the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches so we we have here uh the power of knowledge god did not leave us in this world ignorant and i, I don't mean that as being below par. What I mean is, God didn't say, well, stay there. I'm not going to tell you what's going on. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. Just stay there. Now, there's a lot of things God doesn't tell us, but God's told us enough in his word. And we find it throughout the book of Revelation. God has told us all sorts of things that are going to happen. Things that some of it will involve us, some of it won't. But he's told us enough to where we don't have to. Do you know that's why we're afraid a lot of times? Because we don't know. Have you ever had that? You know you've got to talk to somebody. There, you know, you think there's a problem. And your mind runs away with that and says, well, if I say anything to them, then, you know, it'll, you know, it'll be like the atom bomb being dropped. And 
oh, it's going to be horrible. And, and you just blow it up in your mind to be the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And then you finally go and talk to them, and well, it's no big deal. Knowledge makes a difference. And we, and, and we walk away from situations like that saying, well, if I had known, I wouldn't have waited, and then I wouldn't have had to worry all this time. But God gives us knowledge, not necessarily about every one of those details, but God gives us enough knowledge in his word that we don't have to walk around afraid. Well, I'm afraid of what the government's going to do. Well, I'm afraid of what this is going to do, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen here. We don't have to be afraid because God's told us what's going to happen. And what's going to happen, the very next thing, I'm going to steal my thunder because I'm not going to get to it tonight anyway. The very next thing that's going to happen on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. That's the very next thing. What have we got to be afraid of? He's coming, he's coming soon, and he's coming for me. Those three things I know because his word tells me so. So why should I be afraid? Yeah. It certainly puts a different perspective on things when we look at it from God's perspective, from God's word. Now, I, I want to look at this last thing or this next thing uh, because it, it won't take us very long. There are visions of grace in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 3 and verse 22. This is the messages, the letters to the seven churches in Asia. Insert our whole series here. You know, that, that's, that's kind of the best way to, to uh, get into that. I mean, there's so much here. Uh, these last couple of weeks, we've only done one or two verses each week uh, because there's just so much there. But the thing is, uh, what you have in chapters 2 and 3 is conditions that were present then. In other words, these are actual churches. It's talking about actual problems or actual situations that they were facing. I mean, it's, it's not symbolic. This is real. But then there is, or there are, the conditions that are prevalent still. And that is the application. And, and again, that's part of what we're doing in our series. And... and so the application, we still have New Testament churches today. Just like there were then, there are New Testament churches today. And these New Testament churches, they exhibit the same issues, the same tendencies today that these seven churches had. I've been to all sorts of churches over the years. And, uh, and, and you know, I've seen some that, well, that... That looks like a Philadelphia, or that one looks like a Laodicea, or that one looks like a Smyrna, that one looks like Ephesus, or, or whatever the case may be. They still exist today. You can, you can find those same character traits born out today. So there, there is an application of these things still today. And again, these New Testament churches are going to exist until the rapture. Not these seven but New Testament churches are going to exist here in the world. May not be in every country, may not be in every city, but there will be some somewhere until the day that the Lord comes. And then when the Lord comes, then you get into chapter 4, 5, 6, and so on of the book of Revelation. And things change, as we will see when we get to that point. But we have this laid out for us. So many things that God tells us and he makes clear to us. And, and it's not secret. God doesn't say, well, you know, if you <laughs> send me $14.95 plus shipping, I'll, I'll send you the interpretation. He doesn't do that. It's, it's there. If we're saved, if we have the spirit of God, God can teach us these things. And we can learn these things and we can grow in, in the Lord. But it takes work. It takes study to show ourselves approved unto God. And so we need to not just sit back. Well, you know, if God wanted me to know, he'd 
I would have been born with that knowledge. No. You know, using that log logic, God wanted you to eat. You've been born with a fork and a knife instead of, you know. But, you know, and we have to learn how to use those kind of utensils. And some of us are still learning, uh, you know, how to, how to do that. And same thing, you know, driving. I love driving. But I had to learn. I wasn't born with that knowledge. Well, if God wanted, you know, you, you see what I'm saying? There are a lot of times that, that we sort of throw it on God. Well, if God had wanted, then God would have. When, yeah, God wants, but God wants us to put in the effort. See what I'm saying? Just like anything else in life, if it's worth having, it's worth working for. And if we don't work for it, we won't appreciate it. So all, all those things are true. So when it comes to the book of Revelation, yes, God lays it out here. Some of it is, is like, yeah, okay, that's what God said. And God means what he says. I don't necessarily understand it. But that's all right. We don't have to understand everything. We just need to trust him and follow his direction as he leads us. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.